everyone, welcome to Backstage Tacoma. We are talking to the March 2016 We Are Tacoma artists, and I'm here with Carolyn Smith, who's giving a lecture on March 7th at 7.30 p.m. here at the Community Center called The Politics of the Kitchen, Reading Women's Food Memoirs. Hi, Carolyn, thanks for being with us. Hi, Morgan, thanks for having me. So um, I'm curious to know, because we know that you're very interested in writing and examining writing because you're an associate professor at GW and you teach writing, mm -hmm. um, but what got you interested in food memoirs specifically? Um, well, actually, I was really interested in the author Sylvia Plath, who wrote The Bell Jar, and she has lots of food moments in her book, and so I kind of started picking up on those food moments. And then when I was working on Chicklet, which is Bridget Jones's diary, Sex in the City, there's a lot of um, references to domestic advice manuals, Martha Stewart, and so all these interests kind of came together and I realized, hey, I should be looking at food memoirs and seeing what they're uh, saying. And there was just kind of this explosion of food memoirs in the market and I like to look at contemporary popular culture and so it seemed like a good fit in terms of my interests. Very true. Um, I know that a lot of people are familiar with Julie and Julia, which you brought the book, because mm -hmm. um, of the movie adaptation and um, because Julia Child is such an icon. Um, but who are some other people who sort of have made the cut for the best of food memoir writers? Uh, that's a good question. So I, I looked at I, I like to look at earlier food memoirs in relation to more contemporary, and so some of those earlier ones that I think are particularly good is anything by Ruth Reichel, um, and she actually has a new novel that she wrote about a girl in her 20s working at a food magazine, and so that's, I, I, I like all of her writing, and um, also Lori Colwin's another one from an earlier generation. And then today you have so many good food bloggers, um, Molly Weisenberg from um, the blog Orangeet, and there's the Smitten Kitchen blog, and so many of those bloggers have made uh, books based on the work they've done online, and so I find those particularly interesting too. Right, um, do you have a, a favorite of all of the ones that you've examined for you know, preparing for your talk? Right, do I have a favorite? I tend to really like um, Molly Weisenberg. Um, there's just kind of interesting parallels between her life and my life. She had a baby around the same time I had a baby, and so, um, and she was in a PhD program and then um, decided not to pursue it. So we have a lot of like commonalities, and so I tend to really enjoy her writing. It's just very um, poetic, and she really loves food, you can tell in the way that she writes. And so she's, she's definitely one of my favorites. And I did go see her talk when she was here in DC, because she has a DC connection with family here, so yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, so what is it about gender that is sort of so central to these memoirs and your examination of them? Well, I was kind of interested in, in the place of the kitchen and who occupies it and who's allowed to be in it and in what context and thinking about you know, the professional kitchen versus the private kitchen. Um, we have in our home in Brightwood, DC, a very tiny galley kitchen and that kind of got me thinking a little bit about um, architecture and kind of moves and like now we have these open kind of spaces and so thinking about how in the past the kitchen was really a place that women occupied and how you know now we have all these food memoirists who are women returning to it without that same kind of stigma. I think that during the 60s women really wanted to move away from the kitchen into the professional world and now you're kind of seeing a return to it and so I was kind of interested in why that was happening and kind of looking at that kind of historical shift and how other you know aspects of history and culture might have connected to that. So it's kind of like um, like taking it back, like reclaiming yes, the yeah, kitchen. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I think the way that these contemporary food memoirs is write about the kitchen is that kind of taking it back and also inviting others in. There's lots of male figures that are predominant in these women's kitchens too and so it becomes a, a less gen gendered space in some ways and so I think it's really interesting the way they're reimagining the space and what they're doing with it. That's fabulous and we'll be really interested to hear more about it and to examine some recipes with you um, the yep. night of. So stay tuned with uh, Backstage Tacoma. We'll be right back in the studio of Gladys Lipton. Um, an abstract painter in her 90s who's going to take us through her creative process, so stay tuned. Grandma, she's 
she's here, she's here. Grandma! Okay, I'm ready. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm here to pick up Mrs. Johnson. Hey, Mrs. Wells. She's ready. Hey, Mrs. Wells. Thanks for coming. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you called the village at Tacoma Park. Okay, let's go. The volunteer ride program is one of the services offered to seniors who cannot drive themselves and who are members of the village of Tacoma Park. The request for driving can be for doctor's visits, for shopping trips, or for social events. Regional rides are provided as long as volunteer drivers are available. Like people get frightened when a disaster strikes. Bags. They might run away in panic. Maggie? Pets should wear an identification tag. Thanks! Ma'am, is this your dog? Yes. I need to see some proof of identification. The ID is in the house. Okay. And I've got this uh, picture on the camera. Well, we do need to go up and look at the ID in the house. Okay. Come on, Max. Owners should have papers and photos as proof of purchase. As a pet owner, are you ready? A message from the Tacoma Park Emergency Preparedness Committee. Welcome back to Backstage Tacoma. We're here in the Bethesda studio of mixed media artist and painter Gladys Lipton. Hi Gladys, thanks for having us. Hi Morgan, <laughs> delighted you're here. Great. Well, we're, we're so fortunate to be here with some of your work behind us. Um, why don't you tell us um, how you started working in this style? It kind of looks like um, a blacklight poster to me, but it's really trippy and cool. Um, well, I didn't know I could paint. But I, uh, I have to give you a little background. I, my husband was going through a very tough time. He was ill. And I was crying all the time because I knew he was dying. And I felt, well, I've got to do something that's going to be different to take me out of it. And there were a lot lessons. I came down here, and I was exposed to a teacher giving a lecture first and then saying, maybe you'd like to copy some of this artist's paintings. And I said, no, I don't want to copy anything. <laughs> she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, um, let me think about it. So I sat for two minutes at a blank sheet of paper, and then we were working on paper then. And um, all of a sudden, I just started flowing, painting. And it just happened. And I, I tried to do real representative, representative things, but that didn't work out. So then I said, why don't I exaggerate parts of it? So instead of a circle being, you know, a nice round circle, I put a loop on it, I put a, a diamond, half a diamond on it, I just tried to add something different. And it just came to me. It just flows. Nothing is really planned that extensively. And I watch myself sometimes. I use left brain and right brain. And I say to myself, and giggle, oh, this is right brain. Oh, you're doing left brain. <laughs> so that's how it happened. That's, that's a really funny way to sort of come about your, your style. Yes. Um, do you ever find that a piece, these are very abstract, um, will start, like you start looking at a very specific, more figurative thing? Is that as like a springboard for the abstract work? Very often, very often. Quite by accident, I have done something that is representational. And so I work with it. So if I, it looks like a real thing, I'll exaggerate the real thing. If it's a cup, I did this with a cup. It suddenly looked like a cup. I said, I didn't mean for it to be a cup, but it is a cup. So what can I do with it? And I can make it come alive. And of course, the background is going to be abstract. Mm -hmm. So it sets it up. Uh, more emphatically. Oh yeah, and the color helps too. Um, have you I, always used such vibrant color, and or is this um, something that's come about later in your? It artistic? has evolved. Yeah. It has evolved. I mean, it's uh, it's good. I mean, it's good contrast, and the neon colors are definitely eye catching. Right, right, mm -hmm. and I feel you got to be very vibrant. Mm -hmm. So, when do you find that you're most productive 
like most prolific artistically? Is it in those moments when you're kind of, you know, feeling sad and need something to distract yourself, or does happiness spur on your best work? Happiness doesn't spur it on. I just want to continue being happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm happy when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. But I'm in a kind of a, I don't want to say trance, but I'm in an, a different mode. And when I paint, I'm so intense. I'm nothing, I don't hear anything, I don't see anything. I'm just doing what is flowing out of me. What's the challenge that you find while doing your art or being an artist? you know, and being prolific? Um, well, obviously I enjoy having shows and finding appropriate venues are really important. Um, I'm looking forward to Tacoma Park. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, um, but it isn't necessarily a challenge. I find that curators are, are very open to a new style that I have created. And they all comment and say, we walk into a room that has a lot of work by mixed artists. We can always pick out your work. And you said that when you walked in, too. <laughs> yeah, no, I knew all the work back there, that one's yours. <laughs> that's right. You have a very distinct style, so that's the And that was what it was involving. Mm -hmm. It had not developed completely, if you notice. Oh, yeah, I guess there's more, um, str like the stroke is a little heavier on these ones right. with the black. Right. And that's a little more, more subtle, but still definitely in your in your wheelhouse right mm -hmm. so what are some like artists maybe more notable that you look to for guidance or inspiration or do you just sort of cast that off <laughs> no i love monet mm. mostly because he was an older artist oh yeah he did those, i can relate uh, with to him. those flowers when he had did he have gonorrhea or something and he, did, he, he, he did was flowers. ill yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um but I, I like the fact that he, he was working and doing art well into his older years. Mm -hmm. And I love his contrasts with color. That's probably where my love of color originates. I love his paintings where there's a sunset and everything else is blue, mm -hmm. light blue, dark blue, and there is this orange bolt of fire. It's very exciting. Yeah. like. The Impressionists, which I guess it's appropriate since this yes. is Impressions, this exhibit coming out, they're, yes. they're definitely more powerful than uh, at least more representational things can be. I don't know, something about seeing it through someone else's eyes is like way more powerful. Well, it's an expression of the artist, how the artist sees it differently and how he feels about it as he sees it or she sees it. Yeah. So. Um, it, I, I love the feeling of doing that. I also adore Georgia O'Keeffe, yeah. first of all, because she's a woman artist who has achieved a great deal of fame. And secondly, because uh, of the colors she uses. For example, she uses purple and red. And I've told this story many times that uh, when I grew up, in clothing, you never were allowed to wear purple and red. They just didn't go together. It was a no-no, including the white gloves, which you were supposed to wear as well if you went into the city. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, I love purple with the red. And I found one painting that she'd done, she probably has done others, uh, petunias in purple or something, I think it's called, mm -hmm. purple and red. So I said, if she can do it, I can do it. So I have quite a few paintings with purple and red. So you like that, uh, the rebellious streak. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I would love, I'll do a painting that looks very sweet and lovely and hangs together and I say, no, it's too perfect. And I will put a jarring color right there so that it creates interest, so that it causes the viewer to say, now why did she put it there? And why did she choose that color? It doesn't go with the others. And if they're disturbed about it and they want to talk about it, I've achieved what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Art should be, art should incite questions and, yes. you know, rile people up. Right. So that's good. It was um, so great to talk to you and to see some of your pieces and see your space. Um, so thank you for, for having us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, 
Stay tuned, we'll be back at the Tacoma Park Community Center uh, shortly, and um, be sure to head down um, on March 10th for the opening of Impressions at 6.30 p.m. Thanks so much. Every year, 8 to 12 million animals enter animal shelters nationwide. Only 3 million of them find a home. Guess what happens to all the others? 5 to 10 million animals are euthanized every year because they can't find a home. So adopt a pet from the shelter. Because for these animals too, there's no place like home. For more information on adopting an animal, call the Washington Humane Society at 202 723 5730 or visit their website at www.washhumane.com The forest is special, magical, and very precious. One careless act caused by people and its beauty could be gone for a lifetime. Protect our friends in the forest. Only you can prevent wildfires. To find out more, log on to smokybear.com. Hi, and welcome back to Backstage Tacoma. I'm here talking to Mary Welsh Higgins and Helen Higgins, who are a mother-daughter duo who are gonna be showing artwork in our March um, exhibit called Impressions. Hi guys, thanks for being here. Hi. It's very to nice be here. to be here. Yeah, cool. Nice um, to be here. So why don't we start off and just um, talk a little bit about your mother-daughter dynamic. You guys are showing together as a duo and you grew up with eight brothers and sisters yes. around your mother who was an artist. So let, what's, what was that like? Um, well, it, it, it was really a fascinating experience. And as I've gotten older, I've appreciated it more and more. But really, in our house uh, in Chevy Chase, there was always art. There was always books about art, but then there was always art and discussions of art. And artists were coming over constantly. And mom was constantly taking us to the National Gallery and the Hirshhorn and the Smithsonian Galleries. So, you know, I knew who the Impressionists were at a very young age and Pablo Picasso and Calder. And our gifts for the holidays were often sketchbooks or boxes of pastels. So I started drawing at home, not in our classes, really. I mean, there were always art classes. But there was always this, you know, kind of serious dialogue about art from a very young age. And, um, you know, we didn't really have Barbie dolls or anything like that. Mom would give me a pile of clay and say, here, make something, <laughs> you know. And that was sort of, that was a dynamic from a fairly early age. And um, I got very, I had really good high school art teachers. And I, after high school, I went to the Corcoran School of Art and really made it my life and have been doing that ever since. And Helen, it was really important for your children to be sort of stake their claim as artists and develop their own individual artistic styles, I'm, I'm guessing? Uh, yes, I think uh, not only their individual styles in art, but each of the nine children had their own, own personalities. And some, you know, were uh, lent more towards the arts and others were not as interested. Maybe more sports. But they, yeah. all, had, uh, yeah. they all had the experience of, uh, and uh, I think all, had appreciation, you know, for, uh, for art, and uh, and there are many uh, treasures that we are finding, you know, of of early uh, Higgins children, uh, yes. sculpture and and, uh, and drawings, and, and, uh, and, yeah. and they're they're they've been very appreciated, and perhaps their first gallery were the the uh, cab the kitchen cabinets where their art when they brought home That's from true. school would be posted <laughs> on, the, uh, on the cabinets. And one brother just who's become kind of a archivist of the, archivist of the archivist house. Archivist uh -huh. of the family found a folder with many of, the, uh, of the, the, the things that had been taken down from the kitchen so, and stored, not thrown away. That's true. I had kind of forgotten about that. There were, our, our drawings were up on the kitchen cabinet. That's true. Yeah. That's really fabulous, like uh, your own gallery at home. Although you guys really? said that yeah. you'll be taking some stuff from, from your home, right, and, and um, displaying Bringing it them here. here. Yes, yes, mom is curating. 
all the hidden treasures. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, so today, you know, you both are pretty, it seems like from talking to you, um, prolific artists. Um, how does your current work sort of work together and how is it going to communicate when it's on display here? Well, I, I think we felt that Mary's um, new uh, drawings on, on uh, exhibited Quite here broad. had kind of, uh, had a uh, relationship to the terracotta uh, sculpture and they will be uh, exhibited together yes. in, the, in the cases yeah. along, uh, along the yeah. hallways and then, yeah. then uh, then we'll each have uh, a section uh, of the atrium. Yeah, yeah the atrium. Uh, uh, it's been suggested yes. that I hang uh, a number of the uh, uh, sort drawings. of a gallery of of the drawings uh, along the atrium. Yeah. Uh, and Mary will have uh, a big collage, a, if you will. Yes, she when can I, talk about that. I, I, there is something I'm doing a piece that directly relates to this early relationship with the arts. Um, I've done in the past a lot of collage work and I think mom is bringing out an older one but I'm doing a new piece that is about childhood and it is a found object, it's a child's chair that mom gave me and I've been collaging it and it will be ready for the show oh. in March but I'm taking scrapbooks that I had when I was young and using elements of those scrapbooks in the chair. And it is, it's a physical chair. You know, if you look at art history, there's a lot of representations of chairs. Van Gogh's chairs, there's modern sculptures where they're using chairs. So it's sort of, it's a, it's a homage to that, but also a homage to childhood in so a way. It seems like it'll be, you know, really yeah. personal in like a, a very visceral kind of way. You know, all uh, art's personal, me, but. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's been interesting looking through my fourth grade scrapbooks, I was quite the archivist at the time, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so, and I hope people like it. Yeah. But that'll be one of the pieces that will be be in the exhibit. And Shanti has made sure that it will be in the exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the motivating factors. That's, no, that's fabulous. <laughs> um, I also wanted to, I was curious, um, as, you know, there's those connotative sort of relationship standards with mother and daughter like you're typically the one in charge as the mother but have you guided um, Mary's artistic sensibilities or are you guys more individuals oh, now? That's interesting. I, I, I think uh, I think I have to? more yeah. uh, of a laid-back um, um, method you know so that too and perhaps uh, you know I, I taught, you know, in, in high school and, and uh, junior college and other, you know, informal areas. And it's more uh, uh, giving opportunity for media and inspiring rather than hands off yeah. on to this, do that. And so I, th I think... And I think uh, just supporting. Yes. I mean, when I decided I wanted to go to the Corcoran, mom was right there and very supportive. Yeah. So, so that that was kind of in, in high school when I started getting more and more serious. You were very supportive. Yes, she had a, a very good uh, uh, advanced placement art uh, opportunity in high school, and, uh, and nailed it. I did yeah. quite well. But the uh, <laughs> and uh, the uh, of course I I wanted her to go to uh, to uh, take a look at Catholic University to my uh, my uh, <laughs> alma mater, mother. but. Uh, uh, but then we went to Corcoran, and she fell in love with that program. I did. So that's true. That's, <laughs> that, that's uh, kind of the way it went. And then yeah. you got into the uh, digital uh, yes, world as I well. Yes, I do do some digital, although I won't be showing digital here. Gotcha. Yeah, Maybe no. at some other point. Yeah. For this <laughs> exhibit, it'll be your sculptures. Your this is. Um, you said this was this colored is pencil. This drawing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And drawings, mm -hmm. and then and your then chair. collage. Well, it's going to be a, a great mix. Um, are you guys competitive at all in your artistic achievement or in that type I think of way? It's mainly a dialogue. We are we were yeah. coming to a place where we talk we talk talk to each other about what we're doing and are mutually supportive. You know. And yes. I would say, you know, one of the things I mean, I'm working as a gallery director now 
and so I'm busy organizing shows myself, but I, I, in our conversations, I told mom, you can manage me for this project, <laughs> and she is. <laughs> and she's kind of curating, too. I had to, had to uh, so, so on remind that level, her about maybe, some of your, your <laughs> suggested I, I'm like, darn it, why did I bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> Old habits die hard. hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't usually manage her. She's just the one, you know, uh, unfortunately what happens as you get older, your children, your adult, you still call them children, but uh, the <laughs> your <laughs> adult children uh, feel they should manage their older uh, I only do that a little bit. I kind of, <laughs> I, I sort of resist that a good bit because I'm still uh, physically, fortunately, you know, I've been able to physically manage myself, mm -hmm. both, yeah. uh, oh, no. both financially. You're doing, and, yeah, so. you're doing awesome. <laughs> hey, to wake up every morning and draw, that's, you know, yes. you are yeah. living the dream. <laughs> and yes. to, really and to have an exhibition, yeah. you know, and be active in the yeah. DC art scene. Uh, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to seeing all the work all come together and, you know, in dialogue with the other artists as well. So um, thanks so much for being here, guys. Thank you very much for well, having thank us. you it's for having fun. us. It's been a pleasure to meet you, too, yeah. other than email. It's not as <laughs> nearly as satisfactory. No, no not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you for tuning in to Backstage Tacoma, and be sure to check out the Impressions exhibit opening March 7th at 6.30 p.m. in the Tacoma Park Community Center. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you.